Um, so this is going to be work with a, with a lot of collaborators uh, over many years. And, um, but the, the people who are really core to the points that I want to make in this talk are uh, Philip Rudlinski, Karthik Raman, Panagashiva Swami, Adit Swaminathan, Yusun and Yu. And I wanted to point them out in particular here. So in preparing for this talk, I, I thought about you know, the, the actual natural language processing work that I've done in the past. And, um, I realized it's not that much, but what I did realize is that the very first research experience that I had was actually in natural language processing. Um, I was still in high school, and I had taken part in a competition that, uh, where the prize was that I could uh, um, do a research internship at IBM, um, at the IBM Research Center in Stuttgart, uh, which still existed in those days. And uh, the work there was centered around the LELOC project. Um, and I think in, 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 in retrospect, um, it was actually a, um, you know, very visionary. Uh, it was coming kind of on the tail end, it was the early 90s, coming on the tail end of the kind of expert systems boom of the, of the 80s. And the designer of this product realized I, I guess, that um, really you couldn't have a knowledge engineer input all of the knowledge that the system needed uh, manually. There's so much world knowledge that this is just not feasible. So what this project proposed was that the system actually read text and gather the knowledge automatically. And I think this has been a very successful paradigm for you know, the research that, uh, ever since. But a lot of change, things changed since, you know, um, since this uh, uh, this project happened, um, both in the way that we built these systems as well as what happened in the environment. One big thing that happened is that, you know, the web happened, mid-90s, and all of a sudden we had all of these huge amounts of text, and it was very noisy and very messy text. And so our tastes also went towards, uh, our design decisions went towards systems like Lycos and information retrieval that were very robust but had very shallow understanding of the text. Um, Lycos was, you know, king of the hill for a few years, but then got kind of immediately throned by Google. And one reason I think why this happened was that Google had a very clever way of leveraging not just the text itself, but leveraging all of the information that people give you on top of text. They were leveraging the decisions that people had made to put hyperlinks between certain pages and you know, between certain words in a sense as well. So and by exploiting this, this, this additional knowledge from basically that they got from their users, um, they just became so much better than Lycos. And since then, uh, kind of the story of information retrieval, information access has been around how do we exploit knowledge and decisions that we can observe from our users to further improve the system. So for example, when I now type in the query SVM into Google, the understanding of that term really rests upon what other people have done for this query. Where did they click in the ranking? How did they reformulate the query? If I think about a movie recommendation system like Netflix, um, Netflix has, doesn't do any video processing uh, to understand the movies, right? It doesn't do much text analysis either. What it does is it it has the ratings that people gave, and it knows which movies everybody watched. And based on that, it can get a very accurate kind of operational semantic of what these movies are about and the social constructs behind this. Or if I'm a retailer today, like this uh, retailer Etsy that sells kind of handmade design products, if I really want to understand what the term mid-century modern means, I would look at what do my users do based on um, you know, that, that have this query. Where do they click? Which items do they buy? So what I want to explore in this talk is whether these kind of observed decisions that people make in the context of language could be something that's also really, um, you know, interesting for this community, not just for the information retrieval community, in tackling some of the deep challenges in natural language processing. So, this is really a machine learning talk, and I'll talk about the machine learning aspects behind this, but I, I hope that I'll spark some of the interest here in how we can use all of this available data that's out there about human decisions in the context of language. And there, that's, that is really a big data opportunity. There's so much data about this. 
OK, so it's a talk about machine learning. So let me start by you know, reviewing the basics. Uh, supervised machine, uh, supervised batch learning. We have data x, y pairs. Y star is the true label, x is the input. We have a hypothesis space of rules f. Each rule makes a prediction given an x, predicts a f hat. And uh, then we have a loss function that tells us if y star is the correct label, um, any prediction y hat, we can score against it, assign some loss. Learning then becomes uh, optimizing expected um, or minimizing expected loss. And we have a ton of algorithms for doing that, right? SVMs, um, conditional random fields, decision trees, boosted decision trees, everything. Unfortunately, none of that is going to work for this talk. Um, so why not? Because the data that we get from human interactions is not well modeled by this. It's not IID data where we get true labels. What is the data? Um, it's really better thought of as this system of interactions, this iterative process where a user issues commands to a system, like to a search engine, and this command will call x or a context. The system responds with a y, a ranking, and then the user again responds with something else, right? And from the, these responses like clicks, or query formulations, other commands, we hopefully can derive some feedback signal about the, the quality of the Y. This is really a kind of cycle with lots of dependencies, and it's not well modeled by this IID data distribution, right? Instead, really the more accurate model for, for, this, for this process is that the data generating distribution is is user, a user making decisions, right? And if you want to interpret this data that we get from this kind of cyclical interactions if you, uh, appropriately, we really have to think about how do people make decisions? What are the models behind it? And only then we can connect it to the underlying semantic that we want to get at. And the key point that I want to make in this talk is you know, how do we do learning here? And I think there are always three steps involved. You have to think about What's the right model for people to make this decision, or for how people make decisions? Then derive the underlying semantics from it, and the, only then do we have data that we can actually train on and design the right learning algorithm for. So I'll give you three examples of this kind of uh, approach, and I hope that you know, some of this really piques your interest, and um, you can maybe uh, see applications for this in natural language processing as well. OK. So, let me start with the simplest learning problem in, uh, in information retrieval. You have two retrieval functions, retrieval function one and retrieval function two, and you just want to decide which one is better. Right? So retrieval function one for a particular query would give you this ranking, has a certain utility to me. Retrieval function two gives me that ranking, has a certain utility to me. Now, on average over distribution of all queries and users, which of the two is better? Now, we want to make this decision not based on human judgments because it's, uh, it's slow and expensive, but we would want to make this decision based on observable user behavior, right? Where do people click? How do they reformulate the queries? And the, you know, the first idea that you may have is let's define some statistics, right, um, that we can easily measure. Um, so for example, we could measure how many clicks do um, people make when I give them results from retrieval function one versus retrieval function two. Or we could measure abandonment rate, like how many queries do get not, don't get any clicks in the two conditions. Or you know, where do they click in terms of rank? So these are things that we can measure. Um, but do any of them actually really reflect retrieval quality? That's the thing, the underlying semantic that we want to get at. So we were curious about this question. And so what we did was um, we implemented our own search engine. It's the full text search for archive that we are running. Um, archive being the repository of scientific papers that probably many of you know. And um, so what we needed was some kind of ground truth where we knew this retrieval function is better than this one, right? And then we could check whether these statistics actually reflect the ground truth. So what we did is we, uh, my, my student Philip came up with this uh, hand-tuned retrieval function which we call ORID um, that had kind of field weights for how well does the query match the titles of the paper, the author field, the abstract, and so on. And at some point, we didn't know how to make it any better, but we knew how to make it worse. So what we did was we took the results from a rig and took two results from the top and swapped them with the bottom. 
And on very mild assumptions, that makes retrieval quality worse. And then we did that even more, and we swapped not two, but four results. So what we have now is we have a triple where we know the results from original give you higher retrieval quality than swap two, than swap four by construction. And we did that another way, too. We took the results from original, threw away the field weights. That's flat. That makes it worse. And then we took the results from flat and randomized the order of the top 10. And that is random and makes it even worse, right? So we have two triples now, where by construction, we know this one is better than this one is better than this one. So now, we fielded these retrieval functions on our search engine. People randomly got assigned to one of these retrieval functions. And then we measured the statistics that we had on the previous slide. And here are the results. So these are the different statistics that we measured. Um, and in the, the red bars are the first triple, like original, swap two, and swap four, and the value of that statistics here. And the blue bar is the other triple, original, flat, and rand. And these little whiskers on top um, kind of indicate how we hypothesized that the statistics should change with retrieval quality. Well, maybe it wasn't important to get the direction wrong, but what we want in the least is that, they, that it monotonically, the statistic monotonically changes with retrieval quality, right? Otherwise, it's a pretty useless statistic. Now, if you look at the results here, uh, they don't, right? None of them actually does. There's not a single statistic that reliably reflects the order that we know is correct. So that's a bit of a bummer. Um, but you may say, well, you know, you're a small search engine, right? There were just a few thousand users in each condition. Uh, let's throw some big data at it, right? So people at Yahoo, uh, Olivier Chappelle and others, actually did this study um, on the Yahoo search engine, not with a few thousand queries in each condition, but with tens of millions of queries in each condition, and the same result. None of these statistics actually really in a satisfying way reflects the, uh, the true ordering by retrieval quality. Hmm. Well, so maybe with all of this click data, it's just too messy. Maybe we should just go back and um, ask people questions. Ask the questions and you know, look what, how they answer. So in particular, you know, that's what, what Amazon does. Um, so under every Amazon review, there is this little question here, was this review helpful to you? Yes or no? It's a very straightforward question. You know, there's not a lot of way to weasel out of the answer, do yes or no? Um, but if you look at how people answer this question, again, um, it's not probably what you expect, right? And I would argue in all of these situations, um, you really have to think about what is the right model for how people answer or take actions, right? Take the action to answer yes, no, or take action to click on a link. If you don't have a good underlying model of behavior, you're probably misled by um, interpreting the data that you're getting. So for this one, I'll, I'll point you to a dub, dub, dub paper. So, okay, so what we really should start out with, we should really start out with thinking about a model of user behavior and then if we have a satisfying model that we can also validate, then we can maybe derive the underlying semantic that we want. OK. Let's come back to our um, learning problem here, just to, to hypothesis, which one is better. What's a reasonable model of how people, just let, let's just focus on clicks. Uh, what's a reasonable model of how people make clicks in this ranking? Well, if we want to, Think about models of how people make decisions. That's really what microeconomics does, right? Um, and uh, so the basic microeconomic model of how people make decisions is the model of rational choice. If you give people a set of alternatives Y, uh, then you can model their decision um, as people picking the option that maximizes their utility function. Utility function is this abstract concept that is just a, a kind of modeling how people make this decision. So under this model, every, utility, uh, every, every alternative has a utility, and people um, pick the arc max. Um, now, for search here, really, you know, how rational are people? Um, you know, there are certainly constraints that they're working under. There are time constraints, right? People make a clicking decision not after a lot of careful 
you know, consideration, but they make it within a second or so, right? Um, there are computation constraints, really. How many results do people read before they make the clicking decision? And there's also, you know, how carefully do they actually read the text before they make the click, right? They, they you know, just read the snippet a little bit, and so at best they have an approximate notion of what the utility is of a particular link, right? And all of these models putting additional constraints on the rational choice are called bounded rationality models. And then you can go even further and think about, you know, um, more psychological issues of how people's decisions are affected, like framing, and those are kind of uh, subject of behavioral economics, but I'll, I'll not go into detail here, but I'll stick with these bounded rationality models, which are going to prove very useful for the purposes of, uh, of this talk. Okay, so what's a reasonable bounded rationality model of how people make clicks in web search? So if you look at eye-tracking studies, the way that people read results is roughly that they go from top to bottom, and then they stop at some point k. It's not clear what the right point k is, and it's hard to predict where they will stop. But then a reasonable um, model is that you know, they've seen the top k results, and they will do a rational choice, approximately rational choice, among these top k results. They pick the one that's most promising, the link that's most promising. Now, if that's our model of how people make decisions, things like the number of clicks doesn't actually have a meaning, right? Um, so, you know, if that's our model of decisions, really looking at the number of clicks doesn't make sense. Instead, what should we do? If that's our model of decisions, we should set it up so that this, decisions made this way, would tell us something about the underlying semantic that we are after. In particular, we wouldn't do this, you know, what we've done before, where we, you know, split the population in two halves, give u retrieval function one and u retrieval function two, and then measure kind of the behavioral difference there of some score. What we should do is we should set the problem up, you know, in the kind of Pepsi test fashion, right? You would give every user um, kind of a choice between both retrieval functions, I mean, Coke and Pepsi, and, and check which one they drink more of. So can we do that for web search? And the answer is, uh, yeah. So you can do a, a little intervention. And the, the, the attractive thing about all of these systems is that you can do interventions, right? The system has complete control over what the user sees. So what you can do is you take the two results, and you actually interleave the results. And that's what you give to the user. And you make this interleaving fair in the following way. Here, this is a particular technique where at every cutoff point k, the user has seen as many results from the top k of retrieval function one as from the top k of retrieval function two. So you show this to the user. The user doesn't know where the results came from, and you observe where they click. So it's a blind test. And, um, and then you trace back where these clicks came from. And in this particular case, three of the results came from the top four of retrieval function two, only one from the top four of retrieval function one you would say that um, the system or the um, uh, regional function two won this pairwise comparison. And now we can do that over a whole distribution of queries and kind of get this average sense of which retrieval function is better. So this is just one interleaving technique called balance interleaving. There's been a lot of work on def defining what's really a fair interleaving. And if you um, want to go into detail there, there's a recent PhD thesis um, from the University of Amsterdam by Katja Hoffman that I, um, uh, that I would want to point you to. So, but does this actually work, right? Does that now reflect our ground truth in our archive search experiment? Um, so here are the results. Each is the, here is an interleaving pair that we ran. And uh, the red bars is the percentage of wins that the better retrieval function won in this interleaving comparison. And blue is the wins of the inferior retrieval function. And as you can see, the red bar is always bigger than the blue bar, and it's always, actually, in all cases, it's significant. So this perfectly reflects our known order of retrieval quality. Yeah, you may say now, OK, this was for archive search. It's you know, scientific users. They're very, they're very rational, right? Um, so, but how does this actually do in the real world? So I think at this point, um, all search engines actually use this interleaving technique. Um, and um, there are two published papers, at least, um, evaluating interleaving. And in web search, you basically get the same results. 
If you compare the results that you get from interleaving against the kind of standard techniques of getting human assessments for retrieval quality, um, then interleaving gives you the same results as the human assessed queries, or the traditional human assessment process. Creswell and uh, Ridlinski actually went a step further. They now asked, well, if you have the choice of getting interleaving versus getting human assessments, um, you know, how much is an interleaved query worth in terms of statistical power compared to a human assessed query, right, uh, in this context of pairwise comparisons? And what they found is it's a roughly 10 to 1. The 10 interleaved queries have roughly the same statistical power as one manually judged query. Um, but of course, getting 10 interleavings for Bing is milliseconds, right? Whereas human assessments is much more expensive and takes much longer and doesn't scale. So this is really a big data opportunity, right? Um, we could get a lot of data of this form. Okay, so we now have a way of getting accurate information about the semantic that we're interested in out of um, people's choices. And particularly, we have this kind of comparison oracle where we know, you know, we can give two retrieval functions and we get a noisy bit telling us this one is better than that. So how do we do machine learning with that? Well, it's not supervised batch learning, right? It's, it's, it's very different, right? There are no Y stars here to be found anywhere. Y star would be like, what's the best ranking for this query? We don't have that. So what is the actual learning problem that we have? Well, typically we don't have just two retrieval functions that we want to compare, but we have many. Let's say in this example we have four. And we know that, uh, but uh, so in this example, the system doesn't know, but it's true that A is the best one, uh, B is slightly worse, and then C is a lot worse, and D is the worst, right? So now at every step, our learning algorithm now has the following choice, right? It has to pick one interleaf comparison that it should make. But all of these comparisons that it could make have different costs, right? If I interleave A and B, then that has pretty low cost to the user. Every second result is from the best retrieval function. Every sec other result is from the second best retrieval function. Not that much cost, right? If I interleave A and C, uh, a little bit higher cost. Every second result comes from a bad retrieval function. If I interleave C and D, uh, no, that's bad, right? All the results are bad. Um, so I really don't want to make comparison between bad options more often than absolutely necessary. So really what this is, it's, it's a regret minimization problem, where over the lifetime of the system, we want to minimize um, the, uh, the kind of, uh, the, um, the, how much we impose on the user. And it's an exploration exploitation problem, right? Um, where we have to decide, you know, maybe a little bit cost now will give us more information later. So defining regret, um, we will take um, our notion of regret as what's the probability that a retrieval function that I presented loses against the best retrieval function in hindsight. We don't know what the best one is yet, um, but um, this is basically what this expression says here, but subtracting 0.5 so that everything converges to zero. So this is what we call the dueling Bennett's problem, in analogy to the multi-arm Bennett problem, where in the multi-arm Bennett problem you are a slot machine and you pull an arm and you observe a payoff in a cardinal fashion. Here you pull two arms and you just observe this machine was better than that machine. So how do we do learning for this problem? And we first thought, you know, we do some kind of tournament um, because it's kind of like the noisy sorting problem from theoretical computer science, but that actually doesn't work for minimizing regret. Well, we couldn't get it to work. Here's something that does work. It's a very simple algorithm. So let me explain it to you in an example. Let's say we have five retrieval functions or five different arms of our bandit. And uh, what we would start out with is we would pick one of the arms at random and call this our incumbent. And here in this case, it was F3. Then we play F3 round robin against all the other retrieval functions or all the other arms until one of two things happens. Here we notice that F5 uh, lost against F3 nine times and won only once. So for an appropriately chosen significant threshold, we can now conclude that F5 is significantly worse than F3. 
and we can kick it out because for sure, or with, with high probability, it's not the correct, it's not the best retrieval function. So we take it out and we keep playing round robin, the others against F3, our incumbent, until something else happens. Here we notice that F1 won 13 times and lost only twice. So it looks like F1, well, we can conclude that F1 is actually significantly better than F3. And so F3 cannot be the best retrieval function, and we can kick it out. And for more complex reasons, we can also kick out F4, any retrieval function that's empirically inferior to F3. And now we start a new round. Uh, F1 becomes our new incumbent, and uh, you know, we play around Robin until only one is left. So it's a very simple kind of elimination strategy here. Um, and um, it's very efficient, and you can actually prove some, some um, theory for this. For proving the theory, you have to make some, some, uh, some assumptions. In particular, the most crucial assumptions here is that of transitivity. That you can't have situations where A is better than B, B is better than C, and then C is again better than A. Right? If you have these kind of cycles in your preference order, it's not even clear what's the best retrieval function. Right? The algorithm doesn't break, but the theory breaks if you do that. Um, the other assumptions are less crucial. Um, if you're willing to make this assumption, you get a, a regret bound on this kind of probability of, of showing suboptimal results that looks like that. And if you've seen results for multi-arm bandits in the cardinal case, this bound actually looks roughly the same. You have a log t over t uh, um, rate here. Um, that means it converges uh, fast uh, with a number of interactions. And the thing that was kind of a surprise to me was that I was a little bit worried that the number of different retrieval functions or arms that I'm comparing would be quadratic in this regret bound, right? Because we're doing these pairwise comparisons. But it actually turns out that it's linear as well, just like in the cardinal case. So this is actually a um, pretty, uh, pretty fast decay. OK. So this was one complete walkthrough now, going from a microeconomic model that models how people make decisions to designing an intervention that gets at the semantic that we want to then designing the right learning algorithm for this problem. Right? And in every step of the way, we could actually make theoretical statements about um, the quality of the des design decisions that we've made. And they were not supervised learning. To drive home the point, um, let me do this again. But let me do it for a different model of how people make, be make decisions. That is more appropriate for other situations. So this is my, uh, my Netflix page. Um, and uh, so what Netflix does is it gives me these recommendations of things that I should, uh, that I'm interested, maybe interested in watching. So what Netflix thinks is that Lewis Black is the, my top pick for what I should, you know, what I'm probably interested in watching. Now the way that I make the decision what to watch is more like the following, right? I, I look at these recommendations and, you know, I browse around for five minutes and, Oh, this looks kind of interesting, lie to me. Um, so I, maybe I go to that page, read to the description there. I see that there are other recommendations on that page. I do that you know, for a while. And then I, I will pick the show that during my browsing session, I found most interesting. And let's say in this case, I picked uh, Awake, right? And now what the system can conclude is of all, well, you know, by, by observing this decision to watch Awake, that Awake was actually preferred to Lewis Black. Right? So I'm giving feedback. And it's different from the dueling bandits feedback because the second choice that I make a preference over was now selected by the user. It wasn't selected by the algorithm. Let's take another example. Again, web search. Let's say, again, I have my query SVM. This is the ranking that I get. And then it observes a click uh, on that result. Now, a reasonable uh, conclusion from this is that if, I, if the system had taken that result and moved it one position up, I would have liked that ranking a tiny little bit better than the ranking that the system actually presented, right? So now again, I have a preference statement. 
that here is a ranking that's slightly better than what the system presented. You know, or here's a movie that's slightly better than Lewis Black. Or here's my dad doing the same query, SVM. Um, he doesn't click on anything. Uh, he reformulates the query to Sportverein Mappen and clicks on the first result. So what one can conclude under reasonable assumptions is if the system for the query SVM had actually taken that result, inserted it on the top here, that ranking my dad would have preferred over the ranking that the system presented. We call this coactive feedback. Um, and on an abstract level, it's the, it's the following decision model. So let's say for a particular context, these are all the possible whys that um, the user could, or that the system could present. And the, the, the system maybe picks this particular why. Then what the user does is, does a little bit of amount of exploration, doesn't look at all the possible whys, doesn't look at all the links on the web, or doesn't look at all the rankings or all the movies in the Netflix database, but explores a little bit, and then picks one that is better than what the system predicted in the first place. So we get this preference statement. But of course, we cannot assume that the selection of the user is actually the optimal, right? It's the Y star, right? The, the user may not have seen this part of the Netflix database to, um, during the exploration at all. <clears throat> so this is what we call coactive feedback, or, and also the coactive learning model. And I think this kind of coactive feedback doesn't just happen in, uh, in this behavioral setting, but also in, in many other kind of more explicit feedback settings. So again, what I, what I do quite frequently is, um, my parents don't read English, so if I want to send them something that I have in English, what I do, I take the piece of text, I copy paste it into Google Translate, and this is Google Translate, German translation of that piece of text. Um, so for people who read German, if you look at that translation, ugh, it's actually, you know, it's not really understandable. So what I do is I go in and I fix it up just enough so that it becomes understandable. You know, minimum effort that I, that I can put into this. Now that translation here um, is by no means like a reference translation or a gold standard translation, but it's better than that translation. So again, we have this feedback where the user gives us kind of given a why here is a slightly improved why that, um, uh, um, that's not the optimal one, but it's better than what the system predicted. Again, not supervised batch learning, right? We don't get the Y stars. We don't get the optimal translations or the optimal rankings here. We just get slight improvements. So how can we learn with this type of feedback? Well, it turns out that it's actually not that far away from having the optimal Y stars. And you can basically just use a perceptron algorithm to also learn from this, um, from this kind of feedback. So perceptron assumes that there's a linear, linear model for the user's utility function. And this can really be anything. Though this is just a joint feature map between X and Y. So this could be your, you know, any structure prediction problem that you're, that you're interested in. Then what the algorithm does is it observes a context or an input X query or something like that. It uh, has a current estimate of what the user's utility function is, WT. Um, it predicts the Y that maximizes this, then observes the feedback, so slight improvement from the user, and then does a perceptron step in that direction. So it's really a perceptron, but there are two differences, right? Um, the feedback is not the optimal class. It's not the optimal label Y star. It's just this slight improvement and the regret is defined in a different way that, we're, um, that we have here. We don't have like, correct classifications anymore. The way that we're characterizing regret is that we're looking at the difference in utility between the optimal prediction that the system could have made and the um, prediction that the system actually did make. Now, this is really a theoretical quantity because we never really observe cardinal feedbacks, and we typically don't get the Y stars either. But it's something that we can do theory on and that we can bound. So in order to prove anything about this, um, you have to characterize how good the feedback actually is. And we came up with this notion of psi approximately alpha informative feedback. Could have come up with a better name for that. Um, which basically says the following. Um, in expectation, 
the utility of the feedback that the user gives us. Um, so this just has to hold an expectation over different choices of the user. Has to be better than the, uh, should be better than the, the utility of the system prediction, right? And it should be better by some small constant alpha times the gap that we still have to go between the system prediction and the optimal utility that we could be getting. So we don't know what this gap is, but we assume that the user kind of narrows this gap by a factor, small factor alpha. So that means if you're far away from optimal, we may take bigger, you know, the user gives us bigger improvements. If we're really close to optimal, you know, only small improvements are possible. So this alpha characterizes the quality of the feedback. And then, you know, we can't assume that this always holds. Um, so we allow this kind of slack term, psi t, which basically models um, our model error, right? How well does this linear utility function actually approximate user's decisions? So any feedback can be characterized this way, through al different alphas and size. And if you do that, you get the following regret bound here that's really not very hard to prove. It's just a perceptron style of proof. Where you have one term, it's kind of a margin term that decays uh, at root uh, one over square root of t to zero. And um, the other term is kind of a, a term that tells us how well our model fits, uh, can express the actual user behavior. If it's a perfect model, then this is zero. If it's not a perfect model, the system asymptotes to that behavior, uh, to, to that regret. Okay, so this is a second um, example of going all the way from kind of a model of how people make decisions to an algorithm that has provable guarantees. But how well does this actually work in practice? So we implemented this coactive learning algorithm on our archive full text search engine. And uh, we had a retrieval function with about 1,000 features. Um, and the way that we constructed feedback was this, you know, clicked results should be promoted by one um, feedback. So the ranking that I presented is worse than the ranking that the user um, tells, me to, uh, t tells me about if I upgrade the, the clicked result by one position, just like I had before. Um, and um, there was also some perturbation in there, but let's ignore that for now. Um, it's made for stability. So the, the way this experiment is set up is that in every odd iteration, it would do coactive learning, so a coactive learning step. And in every even iteration, it would then do an interleaving with the baseline, basically that original retrieval function from before. And uh, through this, we can now tell, does the learned retrieval function do better than the, the baseline retrieval function? And this is what this plot shows here, right? This is the number of feedback iterations of coactive learning that are run. And the, this is the win ratio of the learned retrieval function over the baseline. So a win ratio of one means it's 50-50, they're equally good. A win ratio greater than one means that the learned retrieval function is better than the baseline. What you can see here, that even after just a few hundred iterations, it's already substantially better. The learned retrieval function is already substantially better than the baseline. Um, so this was the, the plot that we had in the ICML paper. And, um, a couple of months ago, um, I was actually talking to my uh, student, Karthik Rama, who did this work. And um, I, I don't actually know how we got there, but at some point we asked ourselves, yeah, did, did you ever turn off that experiment, um, the running on the, on the full text search? And he was like, I, I didn't. And I certainly didn't. Um, I don't get to do anything anymore. Um, so Karthik went and and actually pulled all the data. So the system had been running for a year, and we'd basically forgotten it. Um, and here's the result. So this was the cutoff point from before, and basically the system just kept growing, right? Um, and it improved a little bit, and, and then asymptoted. it. But the real surprising thing to me was that, you know, despite all the things that undoubtedly happened, you know, bots coming through, it actually performed reliably in the world, right? I've built a lot of machine learning systems that were supposed to live in the world and perform reliably. And typically these systems kind of require careful feeding and maintenance and pampering, right? This is the first system I could actually forget for a year and come back and nothing bad had happened, right? And it actually had improved. So I think that convinced me that if you have the right model, and the right learning algorithm, you can actually build these very reliable systems that actually perform well in the world. Okay, so that was the 
second walkthrough, going from behavioral model uh, all the way to a learning algorithm. And hopefully, at least some of you now see that maybe there are interesting applications in natural language processing. Um, and you're starting to think about, how could I actually do this, right? And if you are at a kind of commercial company that has its own systems, uh, then you're all set, right? Um, you can implement these online learning algorithms on your system and, and try them out or come up with your own. Um, more likely, you will probably come up with your own um, because they, they may not apply to the particular semantic that you're interested in. Um, but, um, you know, what you really need here is you need an operational system because these were online learning algorithms that actually, re you know, required you to intervene into what the, what the user saw, right? So what if you're an academic and you don't actually have a system um, that, you can, that you can play with? Well, you can build your own, and I enjoy doing that. That's what I did. Um, we've, we're also building, like, a recommendation system for the archive right now um, that's going online soon. But, well, maybe that's not your thing, and... Or, or maybe you, you are worried that, you know, that's not going to give you enough data anyway. Um, okay, maybe your second guess, or maybe your second idea would be, well, I have these good friends at Company X. They have a commercial system. They get a ton of data, right? And they get a ton of users. Uh, and maybe I could convince my friend to uh, implement this system for me at that company. I'd say good luck with that. Um, I've tried this. <laughs> nah, they're always like, you know, kind of busy. I have my own research agenda, right? Um, and that's understandable. Um, but what they typically offer you in return is the following. Uh, if you sign this NDA here, that you're not, you know, distributing our data and leaking, uh, um, leaking it to the outside, we'll give you a laptop that gets you behind the firewall and you have access to every click that people have done since 2004. Hmm. So we can get log data on a huge scale. Um, but how are we going to use that, right? We had online learning algorithms here. And these online learning algorithms actually required you to intervene. Okay, so let's think about what's actually in this log data. What this log data is really is partial information feedback or banded feedback data, right? So you'd have stuff like data from a news recommendation system, you know, F null. That was the system that was running at the time that the data was collected. That, you know, happened to present a set of articles Y to a particular user X. And what you observe is maybe the retention time, how many delta minutes the, the, the person actually spent on the site. Or you have data from an ad placement system, F null, that, you know, that presented a certain ad at a particular time to a particular user, and you observe where the user clicked on it. Or maybe you get um, kind of uh, interleaving results um, you know, of uh, you know, system F null, rankings, with some other um, ranking, and you observe whether ranking A or ranking B won in, in, in interleaving. So the data that you have is more exactly of the following form. You have a context, X user or query or anything like that, you have the action that the particular system that was operational at that time took at that time, so the action of F null, and then you observe as a kind of cardinal reward. It's not supervised batch learning, right? Again, we have no Y stars here. We don't observe, you know, we don't, we really observe what did, you know, how did people react to the particular Y that they saw. So what would you really want to do? We kind of want to change history, right? We would want to, you know, answer the question, what would have happened, or how well would, have, would I have done if I had not used F now as my system to present results, but my new F, right, a new system F that potentially predicted different results or took different actions. So, can we do that? Can we kind of change history? Um, let's assume that all of our policies are stochastic. So are the predictions or the actions that our systems take, you know, given an X and a particular system F, the action that it takes is actually coming from a probability distribution randomly picked. And um, let's assume that this is a nice probability distribution that actually has full support. 
then the performance of a particular system F, policy F, we can just take as this expectation, right? It's just a you know, expected performance of the system in terms of that delta reward that we're getting. Now, estimating this particular performance here is really easy for the uh, system that was actually running, right? What we just do is we have all of these observed deltas and we just average them up and that's our expected performance. But that's not what we want, right? We want to know what would have happened if I had used a different system to select Ys in the past, right? Now we can't change history, but we can kind of rewrite history in the following way. And it's actually a very simple idea that goes back to uh, kind of statistics and the, um, the use of observational data to make uh, causal conclusions, um, kind of pioneered by Rubin. Um, what you do is you reweight your observations according to this propensity ratio of what's the probability of system F picking that action, Y, over the probability of the logging system picking that action. And that's, you know, we could call this a propensity weight. And let me illustrate how this actually works. So let's say we just have one particular context X here. And these are, this is the distribution that of action. This is the space of all possible Ys that the system could take. This is the distribution that the system, logging system F null took. And these are the observations that we got. Um, so a lot of observations here close to the center of the distribution and fewer out, out, um, out there. And the red is, our reward is just, a, let's say, binary. Uh, green is plus one, red is zero. So if we now want to compute the average performance of this policy here, then we just take an average of this, right? And that's, that's what I said before. But what if we want to now compute the performance of that policy? given the data, the same data, right, the same observations. What this propensity weighting says is that we should upweight the observations that are kind of close to this distribution or have high probability under that distribution and downweight the ones that don't, according to exactly that ratio. And if you do that, then you get an unbiased estimate of any of the performance of any policy, assuming that, you know, the, the distributions are nice. And I'll gloss over a lot of detail here. That's great. So we can kind of rewrite history this way, and we can evaluate policies even though they weren't operational at the time. So what um, uh, Langford and Lee and uh, Batu and others have said, you know, we can now do basically empirical risk minimization by taking our logging data, doing propensity weighting, and evaluating a whole bunch of policies that way, and then pick the one that has the best performance. And that's just like the, you know, just like empirical risk minimization. Unfortunately, um, that doesn't always work, and there's a big risk of overfitting, and I'll explain to you why this may overfit. So if I have a policy that's close to my logging policy, then I have a lot of data that this estimate is based on. But you know, if, I big, if I have a big hypothesis space, some of my policies have a really kind of different distribution of how they select actions. And for example, this one here, it's really far out there. And really, the estimate that I'm making here is dominated by this one data point that I just blow up in weight um, out of proportion. So basically, there's just like, the estimate is just based on one example, more or less. So the variance of these different estimates for different policies is vastly different. And if you don't correct for it, you're likely to overfit and pick the one that's like way out there. So, but if you actually go through the learning theory and you're correct for the variance and, you, you know, proof bounds, um, you can actually see that what you should be doing is you should also, you should not just optimize the unbiased estimator, but also a variance correction term. And, um, you know, this may look uh, like an awkward criterion to optimize, but if you go into a little bit more depth, you will actually apply one or two tricks, you will see that you can optimize this basically just as, as for logistic regression or CRFs, you can optimize this just as fast with stochastic gradient as you do in the supervised setting. So you can do this efficiently. Yeah, it works. So there's a small experiment, but I'm running out of time. So let me just conclude. Um, so the key thing that I wanted to do in this talk is I wanted to, you know, get this um, some of, you know, get, get, get you thinking about how we can use these observable data of 
the decisions that people make in the context of language as kind of additional knowledge that you could use for solving the, these really hard problems in natural language processing. And um, I think it's, it's an interesting opportunity. I mean, this has really driven the, the way that retrieval and uh, information access have, um, um, have progressed in the last, uh, last decade. And I hope that this, the same techniques can really bring, um, uh, the same information can be brought to bear on the kind of deeper natural language understanding questions um, as well. And I've given three examples of um, particular learning models that this can actually be done and that can be done in a theoretically rigorous way. All right, thank you. Questions? Okay. Uh, so I'm not sure about the application to your ideas to natural language, but I, I have a general question on the uh, applicability of the uh, uh, of this framework to maybe in general. Um, so I was wondering uh, what are the implications of the fact that users might be different and have different preferences and uh, kind of orthogonally uh, of the fact that uh, user preferences might change over time? Right. Um, yeah, so that's an excellent point. So different people may have different sets of preferences. And so, um, just along. Um, to some extent, you can take all of these models and also personalize them. Um, so when I'm you know, talking about a, a context X, then this could actually contain like, your particular user ID, and it would learn a, not just a global model for everybody, but also a specific model um, for you. Or you could have you know, a specific model for you know, people that come from universities. Um, so that's definitely within, within scope here. Um, changes over time, uh, I actually haven't considered at this point, um, but there are interesting kind of online learning algorithms that would actually uh, try to adapt to a changing underlying distribution. So I think that is a solvable problem, although I, I don't really have results for it. Yeah, for, for the different, oh, for the different uh, users, I was wondering if there are the method could be uh, used to capture that. Uh, for instance, if you find that there are inconsistent, you said one assumption that the, the preferences have, have to be consistent. Mm -hmm. But so if you start finding that they are not consistent, maybe you have clusters of users with different preferences. Oh, I see. Um, so transitivity is really, it's not on the level really of individual decisions. So each, each preference decision can be noisy and they can be all contradictory to each other. The main assumption here was that um, it's actually kind of on average in this kind of expected way they form a, a transitive order. Uh, but you're right, you could have these intransitivities um, and by, by actually conditioning on, uh, on additional site information, uh, you, these intransitivities could go away, right? Yes, and I, I think this is really then a question of how well can you build these models and how can you build um, you know, the, all the side information in there um, so that you can actually get high fidelity models. No, I agree. I was wondering when you're learning from these historical logs if it's a problem that the, the index might have changed over time as well. Um, especially in the, in the news setting, right, where you know, there's a different set of news stories every day, right? So in that sense, the index changes all the time. Um, I think fundamentally, it doesn't necessarily change really how the algorithm works, but it requires your model to actually be aware of this, right? Um, that, you know, on, on certain days, certain use, recommending certain news stories was feasible, and other days it wasn't. Um, I, 
Yes, I think this is, is, is again a question of can you actually kind of capture this in the model that you're training? It's less, I think, a kind of fundamental kind of question of can you do this type of learning? I have a Netflix comment. Mm -hmm. So what fraction do you pick the choice they recommend? Uh, sorry, say what, what percentage do you actually click on what they recommend for you? The first choice. One <coughs> percent? The first choice, very rarely. Actually. Yeah, exactly. I find Netflix completely useless in some sense. And I wanted to see if you uh, have analyzed this, this problem, which is, I feel there are two issues. One is that the user may not know what they want, right? Because we mix our decision based on superficial description of movies, unless you have some other output from input from some outside. And the other comment I have is, I think there is this notion that uh, complicated objects are really very tricky. And I, I don't, I, I'm very skeptical about the Netflix recommendation system, even though there are claims that it predicts to some degree. So I wanted to see what your reaction is to. Um, right. I think. I think my main, so Netflix may also do things, I don't know what exactly they're doing, they may also do things like explicit exploration, exploration where they may put in position one something that um, they're not very sure about, uh, but everybody looks at position one, so they actually gain some information from that. So there's an exploitation, uh, exploration trade-off. Um, I think actually the, the most interesting point behind this coactive learning is that you're offloading exploration uh, to the user, and you're not letting the machine learning algorithm do the exploration. Machine learning algorithms are actually really bad at exploration because they, they don't really have the knowledge um, that lets them do guided exploration. If you already have the knowledge to guide to guided exploration, you would just you know, put that into your system already. So what this coactive learning does is the algorithm doesn't do any exploration, but the user does the exploration. So the user has to deal, or and it's actually has to deal with all of these complexity and the data structures behind it, right? That you know, this is related to this, this is related to that. But I think the user actually is better equipped to do a good exploration in the Netflix database. So in particular, Netflix also supports this, right? They they give you these, you know, these sh shows are different, and people who like this show like that show, and. So a smart user, user is smart about doing this exploration and um, can navigate this complex data structure and then give you also this kind of complex feedback on top of that. So I think, um, you know, whenever we can actually get the user to give us richer feedback, like doing exploration, we should actually let the user do this um, and, uh, and not the machine learning algorithm. So I, I think maybe the kind of the, the, the very highest level message for this talk is that um, some of these, you know, some of the problems that we're trying to solve are really hard from a, if, we, if you actually wanted to do natural language understanding or if you, you know, do, wanted to do image understanding. But they are often very easy for people. So can't we just piggyback the, on the intelligence of people to get us more data and to solve these problems in a, in a more co kind of cooperative fashion? Uh, I think the uh, key problem is, isn't so much the learning algorithm, the, what is the right user model? You know, uh, you can search for uh, location, place. If, you, if uh, the system doesn't know your location, the time, the results returned by the system could be all irrelevant. So in that regard, this may go back to the you know, personalization in some respect. So what is the right user model that is most, uh, so that the system actually can return the uh, most relevant the results given the user's context and profile. Right, and I, I fully agree. So the, the better we can actually model the context of the user's decision, uh, the, the less random will the user's action look like, right? Um, so if I, you know, if I look at web search and I don't have personalization in there, you know, I have these situations where there's the query SVM and it can mean the machine learning methods, the you know, German soccer club, the school of veterinary medicine, the, you know, gazillion other things, um, which looks like a lot of entropy, right? 
but if I actually have the right user model um, that differentiates, you know, my dad is German and a soccer fan, and he has never read anything about machine learning, then entropy in my system goes down. So the better I can do the user modeling, um, the better I can also model people's decision and interpret people's decisions. Yes, fully agree. Thanks.